I like that. Oh man, good morning. I, I need to start off by telling you that, uh, I, you know, some of you ask, you come to Radius, what you're supposed to wear, and, and we really, we don't care. Wear what you want, all right? But I have to, because I have a beard, I just want to make sure and show off uh, that I do have a bow tie on there, all right? <laughs> You know, I don't want to know. I'm going to brag, but there's my bow tie. So. Our heart, man, honestly, here's our heart. Our heart is that everybody feels comfortable to come as they are, really. We want everybody that walks in the door, from wherever they're at in life, to know that they're welcomed here. Not because of any anything of our own, but because that's what Christ did for us. He welcomed everyone. But our heart is this, is that you are welcome to come as you are, who you are, where you're at, the questions you have, the... The passions you have, the answers that you thought you have, and also, but more than that, to come as you are, but to leave inspired to do more, to be more, right? That's a heart. Because we have a message that's worth, that inspires us. We have a message that, that really motivates us to move out. Um, what we celebrate today is Easter, right? I mean, and Easter really is the anchor of our faith. Paul said, without the resurrection of Christ, our faith is in vain. So all that we do and all that we say and all the things we try, if we don't anchor them in one thing, the hope that Jesus Christ did not stay dead but rose from the grave, that's where our hope, that's where our resurrection is. And the, and the early believers, man, they knew this. And so I'm gonna, we're going to do a little, a little practice they used to do back in the day, and I still do sometimes with my friends, is this. is When they would come and see each other, one of the first things they would say because this was what it was all about. This was where it was at. They said, he is risen. And, and one person said, he is risen. And the other person responded back, he is risen indeed. And that was how the conversation started with two followers. Because that was where it all happened. That's where everything changed. So we're going to practice. Y'all with me on this day? All right, say, he is risen indeed. All right, so, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Awesome. Yeah, there you go. We start off well. So, man, we... Uh, as I said, it really is the hope. It is the it is the is what solidified our faith. Um, the message of Easter is that Jesus Christ did not stay in a tomb; that He rose from the grave and conquered death for us. And that is the hope that we anchor everything in. It is the it is the hope that He Jesus spoke about. When he was on the earth, it was in his words, it began in his words. Because when he came, he was a 30-year-old, he'd been, he'd been living for 30 years, doing carpentry, then came on the scene, doing what God had called him to do, and he spoke, he said, I have come that, that people may have life, and they may have abundant life. That's what he proclaimed. And that was something that was that was was shocking at that time because people were just surviving, especially in the Jewish culture. Then they were they were occupied by the Roman government. They were just surviving, doing what they could to get by. But God came, Jesus came in in, in flesh and, and God in flesh, and Jesus said, "I have come that you may have life." He spoke it in his words. He he acted it and he demonstrated his actions. If you follow, if you read the New Testament for itself and watch how Jesus interacted with people, every person that came in contact with Jesus was changed. I mean, if they could not hear, they heard. If they could not speak, they spoke. If they could not walk after they met Jesus, they walked. God, Jesus in flesh, walked on this earth, manifesting and giving life out of death. That's what He not only spoke it, He not only lived it, but He died to purchase it. He, his death on the cross was what paid for us, you and me, to have an opportunity for life. So not only did he, not only did he speak it, not only did he live it, not only did he die for it, but it, really he solidified it when he rose from the grave. Because only the person that has the power to conquer death has the power to give life. Would you agree with that? The person that says death does not have a hold on me any longer. I have the ability to now give life to people. That is the hope. That is the hope for our lives. That we can meet a person who conquered, overcame death for you and me. And he speaks just as he spoke so many years ago. And he speaks to you. I have come that you may have life. And an abundant life. That message is echoed. And yet through the years, this is what's interesting to me. Throughout the years of this message, a simple message that God said, I, I love you. I died for you. Come to me. And I will free you to really live. This is the message. I paid for it on the cross. I solidified it when I rose from the grave. That message, for some reason, and I don't know, there is a reason, that the enemy does not want us to know it's been censored. 
religion has, has tried to bury that message. Bury it under rules and this person's ideology and this person's expectation and this person's judgment. And it gets so buried under that sometimes the message that Jesus proclaimed from the cross in his life begins to try to be censored, but it, it, it doesn't. Then philosophy begins to try to reason away the importance of who Jesus was and what he did for us. And hate tries to silence it. But it's interesting this is, God is too powerful, his message is too important that nothing can censor the good news. And maybe for you, the reason we gather here today, as you heard from the beginning, why we gather? I mean, I don't know if it's your first time at Radius or you've had other experiences in church, and, and, man, but I want you to understand why we gather. We don't gather because it's Sunday morning, that's what we're supposed to do. We're not, we don't want to be just a destination where you show up and do your check mark, and we don't want to be just an obligation where you feel guilty if you don't show up. We want to be a mission and a movement based off one thing. To move forward and let people know the hope in a person named Jesus. That he conquered death for us. He loved us. He took my brokenness, my sin and yours, and took care of it on the cross. This is what drives us forward. This is what we want to be. And so we gather to celebrate that victory today. Right? This is, this is it. This is why we can live. This is why we can hope for tomorrow because of what Jesus Christ did. But that message has been censored. And, but the interesting thing, every time that the message has tried to be censored throughout history, whether it was them burning Bibles, whether it was burning uh, believers at the stake, whether it was, uh, man, people just trying to bury the hope and the truth of Jesus, it never worked. In fact, every time you see a major persecution or a major censoring, of, of, of the truth of, of Christ. It flourished. And even from the beginning, when the disciples, after they heard about Jesus, they were still wanting to be content to live in Jerusalem. But then persecution came and they spread out from there. Then Rome and some of the emperors began to persecute the Christians and throw them in the, into, into the, line, the, with the lions and, and try to snuff out this, this, this thing called the way. And yet in that, it flourished. Because here's the truth. The message of the truth will always win out. The truth cannot be censored. You know, there was in, a, in the fifth century on 402, uh, Telemachus, I always the wrong one, Telemachus, I think that was the name. He was a monk, and he was uh, had come to Rome. And this is a time where Rome was still doing in the Colosseum the gladiator fights, and there had been um, it, it was a, it was a spectacle. People came to watch people literally kill them each other in the rain. And so the monk came and was sitting, and the story goes. Um, that as he was sitting there, he could not bear to see the death that was just being applauded. Because at his core, he was about life. Jesus was about life. And so he stood up and he said, in the name of Christ, stop this. And he began to just speak it and walk down towards these, these huge gladiators fighting this ring of people, crowd going wild. He gets in the middle and begins to say, stop this, stop this. The crowd's so angry that they try to stop him. They try to censor him. You know, be quiet, I don't want to hear this. They stoned him and killed him. But in that moment, when they thought they had silenced the truth, the truth ultimately won out. Because when that, when that monk died, that death, the emperor took notice. And literally that day, the, the last fight ever fought in the Colosseum between gladiators was that day. From this point forward, there was never a fight ever be fought in the Colosseum because someone stood for the truth because the truth could not be censored. And the truth of hope. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't. But I want to tell you today that we are here to proclaim that there's hope in a person named Jesus. And maybe in your history of religion or maybe in your family, things have gotten the way that you've not heard the truth about Jesus Christ. So I want to do that for today. We're going to look back because, you know, Jesus was, was not, he was subject to be trying to be censored too. Because Jesus came on the scene and he kind of threw things in a, in a, in a, up, up in the air and kind of turned things on his ear because the Jewish people, God had given some, some guidelines, some laws to work to be able for them to experience life. And so they began to make up almost what they call fences. This is the line, don't cross it. They say, well, we're going to put a fence here so we don't cross that line. We'll make another fence so we just don't want to ever get close to it. And so they began to make up all these extra regulations and rules and, and all this this minutia of things that you had to do and if you didn't do this then you weren't going to be accepted. 
And Jesus came in, and he didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. But a lot of things they put into places that were laws were not what it was. And, and he began to throw things. He, really what he did was he began to say, look, this religious practice is not the answer for you. It is not the solution for your life. It is a relationship with me. He began to say things like, say things like this in John 14. He said, I, he's talking about just that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can get to the Father except through me. That was crazy because he said, well, if I just obey these laws and I go do this, this translates to modern terms. I, I go to church and I, I don't do this bad thing and I just do all the good things I'm supposed to do, then, then God will love me. And, and, and Jesus like, no, 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 that's not it. I am the way. A personal relationship with me. This is what you've been searching for. This is what everything in the Old Testament was pointing to. A person, a relationship with God. Well, that message, obviously, for some, especially the religious leaders at the time, was not a popular message. They were going to lose control, the control they had. I don't know if you've ever been in a... In a um, sometimes you, maybe you've had a bad experience with religion where you felt controlled and manipulated or just hurt and taken advantage of. Maybe it turned you away from God. <laughs> Or maybe despite that, you still found Jesus. But the religious leaders like, we've got to silence this guy. We're going to lose our control of these people. And no, they're not going to follow us anymore. So we've got to snuff him out. And so we look at the scripture. This is, a, Jesus, this is in Matthew. Matthew chapter, I believe, 12, verses 9 through 14. This is, this is Jesus now walking. And he is, he is he's doing some crazy stuff, man. He's, he's, he's messing with people. He is saying things they don't want said. He's doing things that they don't think they should do. And this is one of those occasions. And this kind of shows the tipping point of why the religious leaders say, you know, we're done. So Jesus went over to their synagogue. And this is where the place they would, they, would, they would bring out the Old Testament scriptures and read those and talk about that. And, and so they were there. And Jesus was there meeting with them there. And where he noticed a man. So there was a man with a deformed hand and, the, and uh, was sitting there. And the Pharisees asked Jesus, does this law permit a person... Uh, to do work by healing on the Sabbath. So that the Pharisees were part of the religious uh, leaders and they wanted to trap Jesus because they did not, they wanted to disprove him. They didn't want everybody to know that they wanted to say, don't follow this guy, don't listen to this guy, you need to stay with us. We like this control, we like this kind of telling what to do and not do, let's discredit him. And they said, hey Jesus, the, the, the law says this, what do you say you should do? And he answered, if you had a um, sheet that fell on a well on Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And what is more valuable than a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man had out his hand and was restored just like the other. The one. Then the Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. Now you may read that. Eh, what's the big deal? He had just, in their face, turned everything they said. Look, they had, they had made up so many fences or laws around the Sabbath that were never something God spoke to. God said, keep it holy, be a day of rest. But then they began to make up these other things where, you know, you can't walk a certain distance from your house unless you take some dirt from your house and pour the dirt out and step on it. Then you can walk another four feet. I mean, this is some of the things they, they but they were so hypocritical in all these laws. They would go and pull off the donkey because, look, the donkey is what they needed to, to do. The sheep was lost. That was their livelihood. So they would take care of that. And Jesus is like, look, you need to understand this. These rules are not what it's about. You're missing the picture. Isn't a person more important than a sheep? Isn't a person's life more important than all these rules? He said, look, I'm going to show you. I'm going to turn on the head. I'm going to heal him because it's good to do good on the Sabbath. And at that moment, the bridge is like, nope, we don't like him. Let's take him out. Why? Because Jesus at his core is saying that religion is not will be what will save us. It is not the answer. And, and as I was preparing this, my heart was just thinking about, I don't know who you are or where you're at, but I know there's somebody in here today that has been hurt because of religion. Or you've lived a life always striving to get God to love you or God's approval, and you felt like you always fell short. The, the hope, the good news, the thing that Jesus spoke, it's not about that. It's about what I've done. You see, because here's what happened. So the religious leaders got their way. Their little devious plan worked. They thought they had it under control. They got Jesus tricked by the Romans. They're going to crucify this guy. Finally, going to silence this rebel leader. It's going to be done. Let me sell everything. Go back to normal. We can go on live for everything good. Well, they send, they get Jesus, as you guys well know, as many you know, that he was being crucified on the cross. He was accused of wrongdoing with none. And we find the story of Jesus hanging on a cross. Now the fact of the matter is they thought they were censoring him. They thought they were taking out the problem. But literally the coolest thing was that Jesus had this purpose all along. 
He said, I have come to give, to die, to give my life as a ransom for many. He came for this very purpose. He understood that there was a gap between me and God. There was a gap between us and Him. There was a sin curse that separated us. And no amount of rules, no matter how good we are, could ever bridge that gap. But God knew that there had to be someone that could take the place that can take the sins that separated us from God. And so Jesus was right where he wanted to be. He was right where he had planned to be. He was on this cross. And so we see that they thought they had censored him. But as you can look, we're looking at the scriptures real quick too. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, 45 through 51. This is Jesus. This is the very end. This is after he has been hanging on the cross. After he's been beaten and, 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 and whipped and blood, uh, beard plucked out and beaten crown thorns, he's laying, he's sitting on this cross, and I want you to understand this, I'm not going to go into all the details, but the fact of the matter, any time he had to breathe, or any time he had to speak, was excruciating. You can imagine, as I was reading this with doctor talking about crucifixion, that every time you had to breathe, you had to pull up on the nails that were on your hands to pull up to get your lungs full of oxygen to be able to breathe or speak. Most people died of being crucified because their lungs were filled, because their diaphragm, they had no ability to inhale. And so they're really suffocating across this excruciating pain. So every word that Jesus said, you've got to think about two things. One, it was excruciating. Two, it was important if he said it, right? If you're in pain, you're going to say the least possible. You're going to make sure you need it. You're going to say exactly what he said. But in those moments of death, you see him talking to criminals beside him, talking to his own mother, making sure she's taken care of. And then it ends with this. This is a scripture right here. Look, at noon. Darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. And about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders mistood, understood and thought he was calling out for a prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink it. But the rest said, Wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again. Pause right there. And this is in Matthew, and John and Luke, it says what he shouted out. His last words were, it is finished. Man, that's powerful. I need you to hear this today. Maybe you've never heard this truth. Maybe it's been censored from you, but when the Bible says that Jesus stretched out his hand and shed his blood and died on the cross, what he spoke at the end was this, it is finished. What do you think was finished? Was it just his life? Well, we know it wasn't his life because he arose from the grave a few days later. What was finished? We can get a glimpse of what it was that was finished, what was completed, what was taken care of when the next thing happened. When he shouted out, he said, um, go back to that verse, please. A shout out the moment. May I go forward? Next move forward, please. Sorry. We go back to this verse. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. Well, let's see whether the light comes say then shout out again. And he released his spirit, and here it is. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now you may hear that say, what's that mean? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. The tabernacle, where God actually, his presence would come and dwell in a place called the Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, when Israel was moving around, they needed a place to know that God was with them. And so God, in, in his own wisdom, decided that he was going to place a tabernacle, a place of that he, his, holy, his Shania glory, the glory of God would rest, and that nobody could walk into this space. It was, it was separated. And there was a foot thick curtain that separated God from man because man could not be in the presence of God. And it was always only one person could walk in there and they could only walk in there one time a year, the high priest. Now here's what you get. Here, when the, the religious tried to censor Jesus, that it was uncensored. He said, it is finished. You thought you had me. You thought you censored. You thought me killed me. But I'm telling you, I complete the plan I came for. I have ripped the curtain in two, symbolizing that the, 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 the fraction and the, and, the, and the gap between God and man has been bridged. Because someone took all the sin of the world. First John, we had the scripture, Michael, First John, um, yeah, First John 2, 1 and 2, my dear children, I am writing to you so that you will not sin, but everyone does sin. Let's stop there. That's kind of like, yeah, we're all going to sin, all right? So, if you all get there, I'm a sinner. I know you, I'm sure you are, right? I'm not judging her, I'm just, I know me, all right? If anyone does sin, we have, listen, an advocate, someone who stands, an advocate, we got a lawyer right here in front, we know what an advocate is, is a person that stands on the behalf 
of another, right? Mm -hmm. This is why it's important that Jesus is not dead. He rose from the grave and he stands before the Father today as an advocate for you and me. He demands justice. He demands not justice for your sin. He just demands justice for what He did. For He is an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He, he is Jesus Christ, the one who truly is righteous. He Himself is a sacrifice that atones or pays for our sins. And not only for our sins, but the sins of the entire world. I want you to hear the uncensored message. That God in heaven is not some old man with a big beard with a lightning rod ready to strike you down the first moment you mess up. Or the God that says, you know, you need to keep getting better until one day I say you're good enough and I'll let you in. That's not the God that we serve. This is not the God that we proclaim. This is the God that came in the man as Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid for my sin and yours. You remember that moment earlier in the scripture says that he said, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because that moment, ha, ha, every sin that's ever been committed by man and that will ever be committed was put on him. Have you ever been in a place, I have been in a place, where I have committed a, something that I just feel so guilty about. Ever been there? I mean, I just feel dirty, I feel dark, I feel so ashamed, I, I feel heavy. I mean, you, you all with me? I, I've been there. I cannot imagine the feeling it felt for every sin to be placed on his shoulders. But he did it. Why did he do it? To pay the penalty. To rip the curtain in two. So that me and God can be friends. Because the religious leaders wanted to censor him, wanted to control it. You have to obey these laws and you have to get within this religious movement. No, no, no. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Quit resting in this religious activity. Draw unto me. I have paid the way. I have paid for your sin. Come to me. He invites us in relationship. This is the hope of Easter. Because I don't know about you, but how many times you tried and you kept messing up? I mean, how many times do I feel so... I'm like, God, I know I shouldn't do this, but I, I want to do it. That's the bad part. And then the times I'm like, I know, I know I shouldn't do this. And I can't, I can't seem to overcome this. And I'm going to keep trying. Maybe God will love me. I may, no, I want you to settle it. The uncensored message of the good news of the Easter is that, that God finished it on the cross. Your sin is paid for. It is complete. The only thing he asks for you is to come to Him. To receive Him. To begin a relationship with Him. It's finished. Not only was it the religious leaders that wanted to censor Jesus, but the very enemy himself wanted to censor Him. See, the enemy, Satan loves to keep you and me in guilt. I mean, half the time we don't come to church on Sunday because we feel guilty or because somebody doesn't think they're going to judge us or what we dress like or what we look like. And he loves to bind us, defeat us, discourage us, and keep us hidden. And he understood. He, he, he knew there was a problem. He didn't know exactly. I don't think he knew exactly what Jesus was going to do. He knew there was a problem because God just put on flesh and walked among men. He's like, oh, there's something going on here. I need to, I need to get him out of the picture. Because he's afraid. Because what Jesus was offering was freedom. Was victory. The funny thing, I, I, some of us sometimes feel like if I give my life to God, then my freedom is gone. Like, I, I know I should give my life, but if I do, then it's going to kind of confine me, or I'm going to you know, lose this, I'm going to lose. We're afraid to just totally, just totally jump off the edge and give ourselves to God. We're afraid that what He may take from us. But that's not what Jesus. Jesus came to give. And he came to give us life. And because he died, he paid for it. But because he arose, he can give it. He gives you life. But the enemy wants to censor him. We gotta take this out. So you can imagine the picture. I don't know. I'm just in my head, but I'm sure Satan was very happy. The plan worked. He got the government. He had gotten people to turn against this. This Jesus, and they want to kill him, so they killed him. And now, you can imagine Jesus in the grave, his, all his closest best friends, his followers have divert, deserted him. Right? All except one had run back and had gone away. And, Jesus, and Satan's probably like, yes, this is great. I won. The hope for freedom, the hope for forgiveness is done. But, can you imagine the third day, that Sunday morning? Man, I don't know. I wish I could have been there. But I wish I could have seen the spiritual side of things. 
When Satan in all his pride was like, I have conquered finally and I am the king. And all of a sudden the ground begins to shake underneath his feet. And he's smart enough to know, oh no. This is not with the plan. And I'll I mean, look, and I'm sure, I guarantee you, I believe with all my heart. I believe, first of all, I believe the enemy is real. I believe he's someone that wants to discourage and defeat you. He is a real entity because he hates God. He will hate you. And he was there gloating over that day when they was in the tomb. But it was no longer. Because Jesus said, look, I have not just conquered sin on the cross. I have conquered death. I have taken what's hopeless and brought hope. I have taken light and brought it into the uh, Taken darkness and brought light into it. I have overcome the world. I have overcome it all. Look at this in Matthew. Matthew 28. 1 through 6. And early on the Sunday morning as the new day was dawning. I love that. I was thinking about this morning I was getting ready. It's like Jesus couldn't even wait. He didn't wait the afternoon. He died on a Friday evening. He didn't even wait for the full three days to be done. He's like, I, I can't wait. I gotta get back out there, man. I let people know. All right? <laughs> First day, man, he was an early riser, all right? So early on the Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. They, they had lost hope. Their person that they had loved and believed in for three years, was it was done. They had given their life, their money, their, their, their reputation to this person. They had followed him and believed in him. And now he lay dead in the tomb. They were going to go pay their respects. Suddenly. I don't remember a story on serial and stories. There's a lot of verses that start with suddenly. Because God always works in a moment. You may look and it may look dark. And you may look at your life and you feel like it is hopeless. That you've been in a prison and you feel enslaved and hopeless. But you never know because God always works suddenly. In the moment you're not expecting. In the moment you feel like it's lost. In the moment <coughs> it seems darkest. Suddenly. There was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the tomb and set it on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Do not be afraid, he said. For I know who you are looking. You are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead just as he would happen. Come and see where the body was laying. You see, he... The, the tomb was not rolled open so Jesus could get out. It was rolled open so we could peer in. Mm -hmm. And it can give you and me hope. It gives us hope. Let me give you a verse. This is 1 Peter 1.3. It says this. Praise the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, in His great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I need you to understand this. The resurrection of Jesus is what gives us the hope. That gives us the opportunity to experience new life. That is, that is ground shaking. That is life changing. That in your life, wherever you find yourself, you don't have to strive and you don't have to try. You have to surrender and say, God, I believe you conquered death. Conquer the death in my life. Take my sin. I need you to bring new life into me. Have you been in a place where you just feel dead? You feel empty? You feel alone? You feel defeated? Let me tell you something. There's a person who's named Jesus who conquered death for you. He conquered it. And the only thing he asked is to follow him. And I, I, I just put this little caveat right here. Following him is not always going to be easy. It's going to be probably more difficult than not following him sometimes. But what you receive in it is freedom and life. That's the sin. That message has been censored by so many. And so many different things have been added on. And so many things have blocked it out. But the simple truth of the matter is Jesus loves you. Jesus paid for your sin on the cross. He took it all. He became sin so that we could be made right with God. And the only thing He asks is for you to say, I receive you. I want a relationship with you. You step in and have the righteousness of God placed on you. And according to other scriptures, it says that when Christ looks at you, once you receive Him, you no longer sees your sin, but Christ's perfection. Now, that's a whole other message in itself because that alone is mind blowing.
there's too many things I want to say and I can't think I burnt my words will not come out enough to say it. I mean, do we get that? Follower who already accept Jesus, do you understand that you don't have to live defeated? That you don't have to live discouraged? You don't have to live in guilt and fear because Christ said it is done. I took care of it. You are my child, and on you I have put my righteousness that I paid for on the cross. You are mine. Nobody can take you from me. If we really believe that as followers, what freedom we would have. And for you today, who maybe is the first time you ever come to church, maybe you're a friend invited, or maybe you've been to church for a long time and you just have never chose to take that step to give your life to Jesus, can I tell you that what He offers is not control, but freedom. What He asks for you is surrender to make you and free you to be raised from the dead, to be at life, and to be more alive than you've ever been before, and to find their purposes and passions, and use them to make a difference in this world. This is the hope. This is why we stand here. I, I have no interest. I have no interest in just coming to church and doing the church thing. I don't want to do that. I'm no, I don't want that. I don't want to just come and check off a checklist. I don't want to just follow a bunch of rules. I want to follow a person that I know has already conquered death, has backed up what he said by raising from the dead. And says, come, follow me. And I will give you life. Now, for all eternity. If you're, if you're on the, if you're online, man, I, if we can answer a question for you, if we can help explain something to you, we will do that. We, my, my ultimate passion and burden is to help people see who Jesus is. I mean, I, it burns inside of me. I don't want anybody to walk into this life not knowing the hope that Jesus Christ offers. And I'm not content to let the enemy censor it here in this community, in this world. And that's why we're driven. That's why we're driven. That's why our mission statement for our church is to move out in ever-widening circles to change our world. And we believe we can change it because we know the person who is hope, who can change it because he overcame death. And so the best way we know how to offer that hope and show that hope is to be a tangible, visible evidence of Jesus' love. Why are we going to ask you, and we're going to ask you to do love lunches. Every week we ask the people who gather at Radius to make a lunch. We think that lunch is going to save someone. No, but it is a visual, tangible evidence of Jesus' love. It introduces them to... You okay? Yeah, you're fine. We're good. Woo! I'll get you excited right there. <laughs> this is why we move out. This is why we move out. Because... There are people out there that need to know the hope that's found in the person of Jesus. Remember what Jesus did at the beginning? Remember when he held the person's hand? Did he have to do that? He could have saved. He could have said, your, your, your sins are forgiven. You're good. No, he went and healed his hand. Because I believe that when we offer tangible love in a very tangible, real way, we offer the door to how them experience the hope of Jesus. And when they are willing, we then share with them, here's why we're doing this. Here's the hope we find in a person. And so we will move out. And we will driven not to stay in this room. We will find people out there and show the hope of Jesus Christ. Jesus said that to his disciples. We'll end with this right here. This is after Jesus was risen from the dead. He comes back to disciples, the one, by the way, who had abandoned him, right? You're like, I don't know if God can use me, man. I've you know, screwed up. And God's like, I, I know what you did. I still want you. I still want to use you. He brings all the disciples together. He appears to them after the resurrection. He gets them together and he says this. He said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of these things. I now will send you the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. And then he gets to say, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from the, Holy, from the power from heaven. Which, by the way, the end of that verse is going to lead us right into the next week when we talk. But Jesus said, look, I've got, I, you, need, you need to go. This message is too important. Do not let the world sense it. Do not let the enemy sense it, censor this. There is hope found in Jesus Christ, and you must go and tell people that he is, I am risen from the dead. I have taken care of your sin. Come to me.
you'll find forgiveness. You'll find hope. And you'll find life. Man. That's, that's, that's good news. We have purpose. We have a reason to exist. We've got to go let people know the uncensored message, the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen.